and we will get started. Um, we have nothing else on the agenda today. This is just a meeting to clarify any questions. Um, you know, at our last meeting when we had all of our licensing and enforcement updates, um, we started talking about the ordinance and it seemed like we ran out of time for some questions. I know there were people who didn't even get to ask their questions. So we wanna make sure that the whole meeting today is um, to clear up any additional questions. So we're gonna go through some of the slides again. Um, and if you have clarifying questions as we go, um, you can either pop those, um, you know, pop your hand up for a public comment or you can um, ask, try to pop in and ask those. But I do wanna make sure that if anyone didn't get a chance to ask their question or their question got cut short last time, that they have an opportunity to speak. So if you're somebody who got a lot of your questions answered last time, um, just maybe, you know, be kind to your fellow panelists and uh, give them the floor um, to make sure that we're hearing from everybody. So with that, we will get started. Um, there's my email for anyone who is um, looking to sign up for public comment who's not using the Zoom uh, on your computer. So obviously the topic is platform accountability. We've been talking about it a long time. Um, I updated this chart and I put some little arrows in here. Um, I added two cities that um, some of you brought to my attention. So thank you for that. Uh, the first is Baltimore, Maryland, um, which has some accountability in their ordinance as well as Honolulu, Hawaii. So I linked those so you can learn more about them. Um, most of these are linked. New York, I did it just because there's such a, a long procedural history that there's varying, there's various ordinances versions and there's various, um, you know, legal proceedings um, in New York City. So it's kind of a unique case if you're interested more in New York City, um, just reach out and I can share some information with you, but there's really no quick link to look at, but all the other ones um, provide a good overview. Um, one thing to note about Baltimore is, that is interesting since we haven't talked about it in the past, um, Baltimore actually has a provision similar to the one we're proposing um, where it would bar booking service providers, platforms, however the city defines it, from processing transactions at an unlicensed short-term rental. Um, and they have an interesting provision that actually requires platforms to verify with the housing commissioner in the city. Um, certain bona fides are what they're, they call them, things like name and address for the listing before it can be posted. Um, so I thought that was an interesting one to share. Um, Honolulu is similar to Chicago and a couple others on this list um, in that they are also asking platforms in their city to do um, the thing that we're asking, which is not process those unlicensed transactions. So again, if you have any uh, specific questions and we can dig into that, but that's just the background of other cities and what they've done. Um, now, I know we sent around an updated uh, ordinance um, and it added additional provisions. So we'll kind of go through um, that amendment. It wasn't very substantial, but we'll go through that. But still this ordinance um, would define and regulate those platforms that act as booking service providers. Um, it would create penalties for the booking service providers that process those unlicensed transactions. And then um, three and four, as we've, you know, we didn't get a lot of questions about this, but if you have any, please do feel free to ask. Um, we are clarifying some record keeping requirements for licensees and booking service providers. These are things that we've heard um, people are already doing for best practices and our tax purposes. Um, we've also added an additional requirement for the city um, to share certain information. So that was based on the feedback of some uh, of the platforms who would be operating in the city. And then finally, we're exist clarifying that some existing practices um, that apply to all licenses in our hearings um, in chapter 32. So the definition hasn't changed last time. I don't know if anyone had a specific question about the definition um, that you didn't have answered last time, but um, if, if anyone does have a question about the definition, feel free to hop in. Otherwise, we'll go into kind of the meat and potatoes of, um, you know, the, the unlawful act and how it could look uh, with compliance. I do have a quick question, Erica. Um, as far as the uh, platforms that have sued cities, which platform or platforms have done that? Um, 
In many of the cases, uh, Airbnb is a party. Other parties include VRBO and HomeAway. Okay. Thank you. And the um, uh, required uh, keeping of records, mm -hmm. that's also of a platform too, when you say booking service providers? Yes. Um, so we'll cover the uh, record keeping requirements here in a little bit, but um, colloquially, I know we use the term platforms. The ordinance will um, define them as booking service providers, and that's the definition here. So um, that's any person or entity who facilitates a transaction between a guest or a prospective guest and then the host offering the short-term rental. So I think we got this question last time. Um, so to reiterate, this wouldn't be you know, if my cousin has a short-term rental and I post it on my Facebook and say, hey, if you're going to come to Denver, check out my cousin's short-term rental. It's a great place to stay. I'm not a booking service provider. Facebook isn't a booking service provider. It's, you know, if that, wherever that ad is listed and whoever would be, you know, running the credit card and collecting a fee um, for that booking, that's the booking service provider. So if it's posted on VRBO, the booking service provider is VRBO. If it's Airbnb, that's the booking service provider. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Are, the, are the suits over the ordinances? Is that why the cities are um, filing the suits? Is that the basis for the legal action? Um, and so one summary is that um, what we've seen, a trend we've seen is that uh, cities who tend to regulate the method of compliance um, or regulation of the advertisements versus the transactions because um, most of these platforms do both, right? They serve a, a function to advertise and they serve a function to process the booking. And, you know, we're not really concerned with regulating the advertising. What we're concerned about is the effect, right? Processing that illegal transaction. Now, of course, how a platform advertises and what they advertise play into that, but um, cities that have been more successful typically do not regulate the method of compliance. And that's something that we don't do here in Denver for other industries either. Uh, for example, in liquor or marijuana, um, you know, in our fire and building codes and things like that, we, you know, we tell bars, if someone's 20, under 21, do not serve them alcohol. We don't say you must use ID scanners. You must, you know, only allow people over the age of 21. You must do certain trainings, you must, you must, we don't really get into that. We just say, you know, whatever you want to do to prevent that, that's great. Fit, do what works for you, what works for your business. Um, just if you process or if you serve someone who's under 21, you are subject to be fined. Um, so it works similarly. And that's what we're kind of looking to do in this ordinance and the cities who have had trouble with their ordinances. Um, what we've seen is that they tend to regulate more of the advertising side than the, than the transaction side. So it's obviously with the caveat that there's a lot more to it and it all depends on the facts and circumstances, but generally that's a trend we've seen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get into that processing uh, illegal transactions, right? So the one unlawful act that the ordinance creates is uh, that it would be unlawful for any booking service provider to receive payment uh, directly or indirectly for that unlicensed short-term rental uh, located in the city and county of Denver. So any booking service provider who does process one of those transactions is subject to a civil penalty of $1,000 per violation per day. Um, and as you can see um, from the chart that we just showed that that's, that's a pretty typical amount. Some places um, have a scaled amount, some places are set, some jurisdictions have way higher amounts. Um, we thought this was a fair amount. So um, per violation per day, it would be $1,000. Um, as I stated, this ordinance does not mandate the method of compliance that a particular booking service provider has to use. Um, we think that there are several different paths to compliance. So um, I added some slides to go through what some of those paths are, um, and we'll take a look at those. I had a quick question about that specific slide. Um, just for, uh, just so that I know, if somebody 
if a platform, whether it's Airbnb or like somebody who processes their processes their own credit card transactions uh, by direct booking, if they book a three night reservation, is that three days of violations? Because we're not the city is not trying to, as you said, it's it's you're not saying whether or not somebody can advertise. You're saying okay, if you process that, is it that a three night booking would be a three thousand dollar fine? Is that effectively how that would work? Uh, I I'm gonna I think Reggie's on the phone and he would maybe be able to answer this better, but I believe it's per transaction. That's right, it's per transaction. So if the three day booking is one transaction in the sense of I've just booked three days and paid for the three days with my credit card. That would be one transaction. If I booked one day at a time um, and each one of those was, each one of those would be counted as a separate transaction at that point in time. Cool. I appreciate the, the clarity on that. I had a question. It's Dana. Hi. Um, you know, one of the, things that crosses my mind when I, I hear and am seeing this is that I know for some individuals that do off-platform bookings and they do that transaction themselves, as we referenced last meeting, they would be considered a booking platform. And um, when I start to kind of let my wheels turn and what this would look like um, for a small company, um, or a small business that is providing that professional management service, a couple of things um, come to mind as potential hurdles. Um, one thing is I know sometimes people will apply for their license renewal and it can take up to, you know, it can take days, it can take months. You know, last October's meeting, we saw that there were 99 pending applications um, that were under review by excise. Um, and, you know, to my understanding is that if it's pending review and you've applied for the renewal before it expires, then you're allowed to continue to short-term rent. And I just want to make sure that that is accurate and that is indeed um, truthful so that it's not all of a sudden where somebody's like, oh, I was told by somebody, like, I feel like it should be part of the understanding of how all of this works. So that's one point. Um, and then the other thing, like, you know, Airbnb and Verbo, they're pretty instant with taking um, listings down pretty quickly. But I know when we've had some properties listed on Expedia or booking.com, they don't operate like a push of a button. So like if you're like, okay, there's a there's a listing that just lost its license, the way that they operate, it takes it can take a couple of days. And I know we've communicated with Brian about this because he'll send us something saying, hey, this listing is inaccurate or it shouldn't be up. And we're like, oh, we've already submitted to have that removed. It just takes a couple days. And so I just am trying to think forward thinking for those that are using other platforms outside of Airbnb that are using their own websites they've maybe built to, to create a brand, how this could potentially come back and bite them in the butt at $1,000 per day as a violation. And so I don't know if there's any sort of thought process around um, possibly like having like once it's discovered to be out of compliance, you have X amount of days to take it down so that there can be that window for booking.com to acknowledge the request to have that listing come down. So it's two thoughts there that I just want to make sure we're, we are clear that listings can continue to list if they've been submitted for renewal before their expiration date and they're waiting to hear back from the city. Um, and then what happens with instances if a, if a platform has a process in which they can't instantly buy a push of a button, take it down. So let's, uh, thank you, Dana. Those are great questions. Let's deal with those one at a time. The first one, um, I think maybe for purposes of clarity, I think you're thinking more of can they operate that short-term rental versus can they list? Um, again, we're not really looking at whether they list or advertise. It's more of are they are they booking stays? So I don't know if Reggie, you want to answer that, or if we can pull Brian in. Reggie, yeah, I can. I can answer that. So Dana, you're right. If the ordinance interplay is going to interplay with the rest of our licensing structure, right? So if a person um, if they're about to expire, they apply for a renewal. 
um, they are they're allowed to continue to operate. And so if they're if they're on our website, if they, they will continue to be on like the notice that this person is licensed um, and everything like that. So that's that's fine. Um, those folks won't have to worry about the booking service providers won't have to worry about those folks being out of compliance. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question, um, I mean, I think that goes back to the, the point of this ordinance is, is VRBO or Expedia and all those places shouldn't be booking the transactions in the first place. It's, so it's not about, it's not about them taking it down after we've, are, after we've discovered it. They are gonna have to figure out ways to compliant with the order and or to not, not book unlawful transactions. So it's not about the advertising piece that's on their website. It's about them not completing the transactions. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Uh, and Dana, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, what uh, Councilman Flynn and I have been requesting and am near demanding from uh, Airbnb for the past few years is uh, regards to taking down illegal listings. We still haven't received any formal uh, information from them, whether they have or not. So this, this is ongoing, and I'm sure that, that will play I had a hard time hearing you, George. I don't know if other people could hear you or not there. It might just be my own internet connection, but. Um, yeah, I lost a lot of that. You were breaking up. Okay, well, let me, let me rephrase this. Uh, in regards to taking down uh, listings, Councilman Flynn and I, over the last two and a half years have requested that illegal listings be taken down by Airbnb and they still have uh, run around the pole on us on those. Uh, so uh, just to let you know that uh, that probably will, will uh, enter into the decision making process for city council. Did you hear me then? Yes, and I have witnessed these two and a half years of this taking place too. <laughs> okay, Thank you, and thanks, Erica. Continue on. Thanks. Okay, so um, as you'll see, as some of you saw, I added a few slides, um, and thanks to those of you who, after I sent the slides, had some other clarifying questions. Like I mentioned, um, this session is really to make sure that everyone understands the proposal that we're putting forward um, at this juncture. I think we've done a lot of background research and work, um, you know, on the ordinance and this, this body has said that it's a priority for a long time. So I just, we wanted to make sure that any questions had an opportunity to get answered. So um, there are a couple additional uh, pieces that hopefully will make it clear. So um, some compliance terms, tools, methods, while this ordinance isn't going to mandate methodology at all, and it's really not going to focus on that advertising or listing function, um, that's all going to be up to the personal preference of individual platforms or booking service providers. Um, our goal is always to just prohibit the an unlicensed transaction. That is That is it. So there's a lot of other ancillary topics that come along with that. So hopefully this will help clarify some of those questions. Now, um, they kind of break into two pieces, right? What, what kind of notification measures um, does the city take or will the city take under the ordinance? And then what kind of prevention measures are available to booking service providers? Even though they're not mandated, what's, what's available, what's out there? So um, we'll go through each of these. Um, the first and main measure that the that the ordinance does require is for the city to publicly post notice of all of our active and pending short term rental licenses. Uh, this is something that is already available online on our open data catalog like we talked about. It is updated every 24 hours um, automatically so um, you know if, for example, somebody wanted to use this spreadsheet to write a script to prevent certain things from happening. Um, that is constantly available. It's updated every day. Um, so it is that the ordinance would require the city to maintain that as a service. Um, and that is something that we're, we're committed to doing. So we put it in the ordinance. Another option um, for notification would be through an email or for use with through use of another tool um, of any active listings that either do not have a license number 
or um, have an invalid license number. Maybe somebody's borrowing somebody else's license uh, illegally. So in the past, we've sent emails to platforms, letting them know, hey, these are listings that don't have a license number or the license number is wrong. Just so you know, that's a violation of our code. Um, we can con definitely continue this as a courtesy. We've talked with um, some of the platforms about this opportunity. As long as we have the resources, that's something that we can provide in addition to our official notice on the website. Um, but it is something that is just resource dependent. So um, right now we're able to do it. So we're happy to do that. Uh, now on the platform side, the booking service providers, what are some ways, uh, a lot of questions were, how can they comply? I don't really understand. I know many of you don't work for a platform. So um, these are some of the things that we've talked about here that other cities talk about. Um, the first is that mandatory field that Councilman Flynn asked for a few years ago that um, as George stated, has been you know talked about for many years on this committee. So um, just so that everyone's clear, a mandatory field would um, require hosts to input their license number or input a license number um, onto a listing before they're allowed to post it. That's something that the platforms can choose to do. I think many of them have an optional field for a license number um, since that is required of a host. Um, so, you know, this could be something as simple as, you know, making that question on their listing mandatory as opposed to optional. That's one, that's one way to help compliance. Another way would be for a platform to verify the validity of that license before allowing the, um, the host to list. Um, this is required in Baltimore, as I mentioned, but um, again, they could write a script, they could require hosts to upload a copy of their license, just like we require hosts to upload a copy of their, you know, utility bill or other things like that. Um, and, you know, I'm not a tech expert. I don't work in Silicon Valley. I, I'm sure there are much more tech savvy entrepreneurial ideas um, that platforms have and could come up with to, to verify the validity of that license using that data that we provide. Um, but that's another path to compliance. And then finally, you know, some of you have talked about either deactivating or removing listings um, that may have, you know, maybe missing a license number or have an invalid license number. Um, if you have a mandatory field, this probably wouldn't be as big of a problem with the missing license number. Um, but, you know, we, we understand that everyone's human. This could be a follow-up, um, you know, if anything slips through the cracks, you know, on the front end of whatever prevention measures that a platform wants to take, um, they could always take down a listing that they realize is not licensed um, or is using somebody else's in, a license invalidly uh, before they book that transaction. So um, they don't have to do any of these things uh, under the ordinance, but these are, these are different ways, um, suggestions and ideas, just so that people could get an idea of what are the, what are the options, right? What are some of the options? So with that, I, I wanted to put together kind of a case study of a few of the options just so people could see how they would work, who would be responsible for what, uh, and at what different phases, you know, responsibility would lie. So um, this would be a very strong platform prevention method um, using some of those mandatory field, using, the, using a script to, you know, pull from our excise uh, spreadsheet of valid licenses that's posted daily. Um, really a platform taking, you know, positive preventive steps to, to not process transactions. So um, the first thing that would happen would be a, a non-compliant host, which luckily we don't have a huge problem with in Denver. We have pretty compliant community. So uh, kudos as always to our compliant hosts, but say there's someone out there who's just, you know, not concerned with following the rules. They create a listing uh, for an unlicensed short-term rental. They, they don't have a license, they put in a fake one or they leave one off. Um, and then once that listing is created, then the booking service provider um, would be responsible for you know, identifying that license or that unlicensed listing. Um, they can do, use that doing the city data or any other number of those prevention methods, um, or they might miss it. You know, those are the two options, right? Um, regardless of what happens in that identification stage, um, the platform has, you know, the capability and the responsibility under the ordinance to either, uh, to prevent that transaction from happening, right? So um, they can either succeed in doing that, preventing that transaction from happening, and great, they're in compliance. 
um, with the ordinance and we're meeting our goal of reducing those transactions. However, if they process that transaction for an unlicensed listing, that could result in city enforcement and a fine, just like if a bar serves somebody who's under the age of 21. So that would, that's what that path could look like. But the main, the main takeaway is that prevention is, is compliance. So another way that this could look, another path to compliance, another method that could be used is notice and takedown. Um, this is in addition to that um, platform prevention and this is just a different option. Um, so if that non-compliant host creates a listing without a number, maybe they don't have a mandatory field, uh, maybe they're just relying on you know, takedown methods, that's okay under the ordinance, um, but here's what could happen under that scenario. So. Um, you know, it could be something where we, the city, um, find some listings, as I mentioned on the two options that we have, in addition to our responsibility to post that spreadsheet daily, um, we might find a bunch and say, hey, these are, these are kind of at-risk listings, you know, they don't have a valid license number, um, just so you know that they're on your website, um, that could be through an email, it could be through um, a tool that a platform has created, you know, things like that, all subject to resources. Um, but we, you know, may not have those resources or we may be busy and we may also miss it, right? Again, whatever happens in that identification phase, the booking service provider is the one that is responsible for the transaction. So um, I think some, a lot of you have questions about, well, what if they take down? Is there a cure time? that's all up to the platform, right? That's something that we're not trying to dictate because we know that different platforms and different booking service providers with different brands or different levels of you know, customer service that they want to achieve might have different ideas about the best way to both prevent transactions and have great customer service. So we you know, are not gonna get involved in that discussion, but some of the ways we've heard is you know, preventing that transaction um, you know, putting maybe a hold or something on the listing until that host can cure. Maybe they say, hey, we, we see that you don't have a license or we see that this license number doesn't match the information in the spreadsheet. Maybe the host just typed in the wrong number. Maybe they hit seven when they meant to hit eight. And so they can say, oops, I'm so sorry. Here's a copy of my license. As you can see, I typed in the wrong number and the platform can say, great, you're good to go. You can process transactions. Again, you've, pre you've prevented it until the host can cure it, so no harm, no foul. The other option they could choose to do is take that listing down entirely. That's up to them. Um, but regardless of what, you know, regardless of who identifies or how, or, or what I said, what happens in that identification stage, the main takeaway is that if, that if a transaction is processed for that unlicensed listing, it could result in a fine for the platform issued from the city. So um, a couple of you asked if these two you know, scenarios and case studies are mutually exclusive. And so I added this third slide um, recently just to, to make it clear that these all live in the same universe, right? These are two different paths, but they exist in the same universe. So um, there's any number of issues that could arise with the creation of an unlicensed listing. Um, I'm sure there are um, creative hosts out there who are non-compliant, who you know, are already thinking, right? Um, and then the identification stage, you know, that can happen in a couple of different ways, right? Um, the main way would be through the use of that city data, that notification that, you know, here's a daily updated spreadsheet that is for use to, to use in compliance with this ordinance. It is the official data, it is the full data set, and it is available to everybody. Um, you know, like I mentioned, when the city has additional resources, may, we may warn a booking service provider, say, hey, um, you know, obviously you're not in violation of the ordinance yet because, you know, we, posting a listing alone is not a violation. Um, however, you should know that these listings, if processed, would, would put you in violation. Um, so there's many different ways that identification can happen, but no matter what, the responsibility for the transaction is on the booking service provider who processes that transaction or prevents the transaction. If they prevent it, they're in compliance. If they process it, they're subject to fine. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know that was kind of a lot of information, but um, I wanna make sure that that process and that flow of who's responsible at what stage um, is clear to everybody. I have a question. This is David Pardo speaking. Um, I'll turn on my video. Uh, 
so anyway, um, my one thing that came up in my mind is on Airbnb, this is just an example. If somebody books, uh, particularly a, a larger booking, uh, like let's say they're staying for a week at a four or five bedroom house, their, their total can be, you know, in the multiple thousands of dollars. And uh, if, they, if they're booking months in advance, they can often pay part of their payment at the time of booking and part of their payment I don't know, 14 days before they arrive. And then as a host, the host of that listing doesn't actually get paid until the, biz until the business day that follows the day of check-in. So I was wondering when it comes to like a booking service provider processing a transaction, what is the date that would cause a fine to be issued? Is it the day that a uh, guest books? Or is it the day that a guest pays? Or is it the day that the guest checks in? Or is it when the host gets paid? It's the day that a transaction is processed. So I guess if a transaction is processed, the day that the that the day that a, a guest hits book, if that transaction is processed, you know, instantaneously. That's the day that the tra that a transaction is processed. A second transaction may be processed later, um, but either of those, if that is for an unlicensed short-term rental, either of those transactions could qualify. So, cool. Okay, that I just that makes sense to me. I just wanted some clarification on it. I'll also just add in, David. This is Reggie. So, I mean, that's that's kind of factual. Like, that's going to depend on. A bunch of different circumstances and we'll have to we'll have to review those as they come when we've when we've already enacted the ordinance and and make that determination on on when exactly the transaction may have occurred yeah. I think we have a question from cindy has her hand raised uh yes i just wanted to say as a taxpayer of denver i think this is a very prudent process because we are going into a downturn right now and we don't have the money for all the personnel that we might normally. So I applaud you for making this process like two ways that can happen, but in the end, the platform is responsible. I don't think a platform should determine how many people we need to staff to keep this a compliant ordinance. So I think this process is very good, very well thought out, and I appreciate um, what you're all doing. I don't think we should be formed by the platforms. They need a very simple step to put this into play. So I don't understand anything at all that Airbnb was saying last week, and I think this is wonderful. Thank you. I have a question. This is Buffy. Um, I don't understand the mechanism for the people who are in limbo. You know, the ones who have made an application and it hasn't been acted one yet. Will they be getting a provisional license number or something like that? Also, um, what about people who do exclusively long term, 30 nights or more? Do they have to get a license number? So that's the second question is easy. No, if you if you if you never short term rent, if you only long term rent, you do not need a short term rental license. Um, I know Councilwoman Gilmore has um, spoken a few times about her desire to create a long term rental license or registry. Um, that's not something that uh, we are leading on. So if you have questions about that, um, they should be directed to Councilwoman Gilmore about that particular. But at the current time, we do not have any kind of license for a long-term rental. Um, and then remind me, sorry, what was your first question? Um, the ones that are in limbo, the ones who have applied for a license and they haven't gotten a license yet, how, how is that managed? What are the mechanics of that? So, you know, obviously it wouldn't have a number, right? Or do they get a provisional number? How does Airbnb know they can go ahead and rent to them? Um, even if they don't have that number, or do they just do it and then hope they, it turns out all right? I, I just don't understand the mechanism. Um, 
so as Reggie mentioned last time, if it's somebody who say has an existing short-term rental license and they're waiting for their renewal to go through, they would use their same license number and they can operate while their renewal is pending. Um, however, if it's somebody who's never short-term rented before and they're waiting for their license to be approved, um, you know, under our opinion, anytime they, if they operate at all, if they book any stays at that short-term rental before they have a license, that would be operating without a license. So that host would be liable. And if, um, if a platform were to facilitate that transaction under this ordinance, the platform would also be liable. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Erica, I have a question. Okay. To kind of follow up from what Susan was saying, and I know I'm very new on this committee and uh, I'm, I've probably missed a lot of this, but I was really surprised um, at uh, Airbnb's reaction in the last meeting to all of this. Can you be more specific with us as to what they're upset about? Um, I'm happy to take that if that's helpful. Yeah, we can that that I, this is our Airbnb representative, so Aisha, you might want to answer that. Yeah, for sure. So as we, and oh, since over the last two weeks between Erica, Molly, and I, we've talked multiple times to align, but high level, our read of the ordinance language as it stands was and does require, is really prescriptive and requiring a pre-verification system. I know Erica listed out a few methods of compliance, but we've also pretty consistently heard from Erica and Excise and Licensing that they're not trying to be prescriptive. And so at this juncture, we're both just talking to our legal teams and trying to find a pathway forward is what I can share. I think we are pretty close. I think all of this requires a little bit of a leap of faith, both on the city side and our side. And so our attorneys are talking to each other. We're trying to figure out what are the I's to dot, the T's to cross to get us to the other side. But on its face, our legal team is interpreting the language as it's drafted to be very prescriptive. Again, we're hearing from the city that that's not the intention. And so we're trying to find the middle ground. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just say, I know this conversation has been years in the making. It predates my time. But again, like we, the world is quite literally burning around us and we want to be partners. We want to make sure we get to the other side in a way that meets your needs, that meets our needs. Um, we're pretty confident and hopeful that we'll get there. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other panelists with their hands raised. Strack members, do you have any other questions about some of these um, paths to compliance or methods or tools or the universe that they all sort of exist under? I do have a question. So if a listing is not in compliance and maybe it was in compliance when the uh, renter first rented the listing, is there any way that there could be a posting on the actual residence to let any renters know that this is no longer a compliant uh, listing or a compliant residence? Um, that is not something we've anticipated or um, talked about on, as far as this ordinance goes. Um, what we're hoping is that we, I can see the question kind of centers around what happens if the uh, host is compliant at the time the transaction is processed, but then comes out of compliance. Yes. I think that's a separate problem and that's an interesting issue and I think maybe um, what we can do is um, you know if after the, if the ordinance is adopted and after it goes into effect then you know maybe doing some um, data collection to see if you know is that occurring if it's occurring how often and then you know if it's occurring often enough that it's a big problem then we can maybe talk about some tailored solutions but um, I would definitely want to see some data to, to know just how big of a problem that is before we, you know, tackle that, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, any other questions before I move on? 
Hearing none, I will go to the next slide. Um, so here are the record keeping requirements. Um, these are obviously um, something that I know someone had a question on, but um, what we've heard by and large are these are things that um, will help with the enforcement of this ordinance, um, but are also things that everyone is probably already doing anyway for tax purposes or for their own record keeping. Um, for short-term rental licensees, these are the hosts um, just keeping on record for one year, the total number of nights they rented their short-term rental and then the dates that it was rented. Um, and that would only, you wouldn't have to provide that affirmatively. It would only be, um, you know, if, if asked uh, by the department. And that would be, you know, to, to determine whether an illegal transaction was processed. It wouldn't be for any other purposes. Um, another record keeping requirement would be for the booking service providers to keep certain records for five years. Um, and including who offered the short-term rental, that the name of that person, the address of that short-term rental, the license number associated, and then um, the dates and price paid um, for the short-term rental that was booked. So like I mentioned, these are things that I think most of you keep for tax purposes. Um, it would just be making sure that you keep those for a certain period of time, just in case. Um, in addition to the, those first two record keeping requirements, we did amend the ordinance after our last meeting. I sent that around. Um, there's a third provision that does require the department to keep uh, and maintain a list of all um, valid licensed short-term rentals within the city at all times. So currently that is updated every 24 hours. Uh, we don't anticipate that changing, but that is our responsibility um, under the ordinance in the code. So. Those are the record keeping requirements. I see a few hands raised from the panelists. I see Mary Lou. Um, Erica, this slide refers to records that the booking service providers are supposed to keep, mm -hmm. but the ordinance says information. Okay, 3355A specifies records for the short term rental host but B specifies information for the platform. And records and information are very different. Records bespeaks intentionality. Information bespeaks maintain a pile of crap and every five years we'll ask you for something specific from it. What is your, um, what's your question? I think this might be a good one for Reggie. So Mary Lou, are you just wondering about whether or not one should say record or one should say information or whether or not they should be consistent? I, I think both of them should say records because I think we want some responsibility here and therefore that requires intentionality and I don't read information as intentional. Okay, um, thank you for that feedback. We'll, we'll, look, into, we'll look into that. Okay, any other questions um, from STRAC members on the information and record uh, provisions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Why is it five years instead of seven years that the IRS requires? How, how is the five year derived? I'm also gonna pass that one to Reggie. So when we had when we had spoken about this, I mean, it it could be seven years. It's not. We didn't base it off of the IRS guidelines. Um, five years, I believe, is what the department would need to to be able to come back to these. It could be seven, um, but it's if if you all would like for us to do seven, or if if that's some feedback that you want to give to the department, that's something that could be considered. I have one question related to that, which is obviously with any anybody breaking any ordinance or law, there's a statute of limitation. And so if the statute of limitation on finding a platform is five years, I don't think asking for seven years worth of records serves any particular purpose. And at the same time, if the statute of limitation is 10 years, then we should be asking for 10 years, that they keep 10 years of records. Uh, I, as a, a note, as an Airbnb host, um, I went and checked and I can still get my records from when I started hosting in 2014. So it would appear that at least Airbnb already, from what I can tell, keeps records forever. 
Um, so it's a thing that's out there. We, we appreciate that feedback. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, any other questions or comments on this topic? Okay, Cindy, I see you have your hand raised, but I think it's this, I think it's just from the last question you asked, correct? I lowered it on my end. I don't oh. know why it still shows. Huh, that's, oh. Okay. Maybe just a lag. Thanks. It happens, okay. Um, all right, so then the last thing, the last topic is um, other our other proposed changes. There are, there's language in the ordinance that amends chapter 32. So um, as many of you know, who've been with us, chapter 32 applies to all of our licenses in the city, all the licenses issued by the department. Um, and so these are things that, you know, when we're in the code making changes, um, as part of thinking through the process of how this would work for platform accountability, we realized that there was some clarity missing um, about our existing practices. And in the spirit of transparency, those should be included in the ordinance so everyone can see that. So uh, some of those clarifications would include um, those standard procedures for hearing officers who provide all the recommended decisions in departmental hearings, whether it's for a denial appeal for a short-term rental, or it's to, you know, for a liquor license or a marijuana license or any other um, hearing that happens. Um, same with the procedures for issuing subpoenas. This is something that, you know, we do often and frequently in all of our licensing hearings. So um, just putting those existing practices into ordinance so that anyone who shows up for a hearing is able to read the ordinance and know what, what the process looks like. Any questions about that? Wonderful, okay. So uh, in Wait, summary- I do have a question. You? Okay, perfect, we'll go back. Okay, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask, what other decisions other than the hearing officer's written findings does the director take into account when making the final decision? So, when the director is making the final decision, they would consider the entire record um, along with the hearing officer's decision. So the hearing, the you know, if the director wanted to go back and actually listen to the entire proceeding to make sure that the hearing officer made a, a correct determination, um, she can do that as well. She can consider the the files, all the filings that have been submitted, the application, anything that was attached to the application. So it's it's normally more than just the the recommended decision that's put forth by the hearing officer. And, okay. And in some cases, Cindy, especially um, in liquor or marijuana, like a needs and desires hearing, um, applicants have an opportunity if the hearing officer recommended an, a decision that, you know, that they don't get a license, they have an opportunity to respond to that and, you know, kind of make a, a last pitch as to why they think that decision is wrong. And then uh, any neighborhood witnesses could also respond and say, here's our last pitch, why we think the hearing officer was right. Those would also be considered by the director in those cases. Great, okay, so it increases the hearing, the process, um, which is good. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have Mary Lou as well. Yeah, I have a question about 32-1B. Um, which says the director may designate a hearing officer. That to me suggests there can be only one. Is that the intention or do we want the director to be able to designate multiple hearing officers if necessary? And that's a good Sorry, point. I'm sorry to be picky, but we lawyers do that. No worries. Um, our, in our canons of construction and in, in, um, section one of the, the revised municipal code, the, the singular includes the plural and vice versa. Okay. And typically in practice, um, you know, a, a, a one singular hearing officer does preside over a, a hearing, but we have, um, you know, we have several hearing officers that can be assigned to, um, just to be able to staff all of our different hearings. So um, we rotate through them.
Does that answer your question, Mary Lou? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, any other questions about um, anything we've discussed so far? Okay, seeing none. Um, just in summary again, what does the ordinance mean? Um, kind of those high level points of what, what this ordinance will do. Um, it will define and regulate um, those booking service providers um, and require them not to process transactions for unlicensed listings. It lays out that responsibility, but it does not prescribe which method they use um, to comply. Um, we've talked about some today, but you know, like we mentioned, it's whatever a platform is comfortable with, whatever they have the resources to do. Um, you know, they, they understand that this is the result if a, if a transaction is processed, this is the result if the transaction is not processed. Um, in addition to assist with our investigations of this type of, um, you know, new unlawful act, we're asking hosts and platforms to have those records available um, if need be. Um, again, many already keep these, as David mentioned, it looks like um, even beyond the existing time period required, so um, shouldn't be too difficult to comply with that. And finally, it allows our city, um, after two years of talking about it, after looking at city after city, you know, try to get this right, um, we think this ordinance will help us keep pace with the evolution of the short-term rental industry, which is very young, but very robust. Um, and, you know, as, a, as our responsibility as public servants to just continuously improve and tweak our regulatory framework um, to share the responsibility for compliance, um, not just on the city, not just on hosts, where a lot of that compliance effort has been focused, you know, in the first five years. Um, us, you know, we in Denver, like other cities and, you know, other countries globally are looking to spread some of that responsibility to be shared by the platforms who uh, participate. So let's talk about timing. Um, we talked about this a little bit last time. We did present to PRC on September 25th. Um, they gave us the go ahead to pursue legislative process. Um, so we presented that first draft on October 13th. Um, again, thank you to so many of you adding some time in for an extra meeting today. Um, it's really great to make sure that we get all of, our, all of your questions answered before we present this at the biz committee next Wednesday. Um, if any of you would like to join the biz committee, I will be sending out a short-term rental bulletin um, with the information about how to join that, um, as well as, um, you know, we'll be giving a very similar presentation. Um, and then if it passes out of business committee, um, it would then go to the full council. So um, we will, like we did with our last ordinance on primary residence, we will keep you all posted on each step of the way um, and how to participate via our short-term rental bulletin. Doesn't look like we have any other questions um, from the STRAC members, is that correct? Okay. I just wanted to say thank you for uh, hosting this meeting and also for uh, all the work that you've put in. I think the um, city office has done a really good job on this and I appreciate it. Thank you, Buffy. Eric, uh, I would I would second that, and I had a chance to talk to you about a lot of this previously, so I didn't really need to ask many clarifying questions, but the way you've documented and laid out the framework and the steps and the process, I think is very clear, and that was really needed following the last meeting, so great job, and I'm encouraged and pleased to hear um, Aisha and Airbnb um, making strides in working with the city because I think that's really critical given the material component of the bit of the total city's business that resides on that platform. So that's really important and um, to the team that's working, all of you from the city and Airbnb to get to an end state that works and can manage to our regulatory environment, I think is cr critically important for all of us. So um, well done team. And I would- And I just, <laughs> sorry, Marion, go for it. I, I just wanted to agree with that. It, I just think the hard work by the city is wonderful and um, you guys have done a great job. And I love how you talk about the spirit of transparency. There's a spirit of goodwill that I can feel. And, and I'm very hopeful for the feeling of cooperation with Airbnb and, and the other platforms. And I do hope it continues. So well done. 
Awesome. Um, I'll just jump in again. Like, thank you everyone for your time. I, we've, we're continuing to have the conversations to get this over the finish line. We, in, we were really pleased to see the addition of some additional slides on the potential methods of compliance. So the notice and takedown approach is one we're using in Baltimore and Honolulu and a lot of the cities that Erica and the team listed, but we have our engineering resources ready to stand up a mandatory permit field to go forth with the notice and takedown process. I know we'll continue to find hurdles and work through them, but where we wanna to continue to work with the city in the spirit of collaboration and partnership. And I think that's, um, thank you for that Aisha and thank you everyone else for your comments as well. I think uh, one other thing to keep in mind that maybe I didn't mention uh, throughout the presentation um, you know, just like when we first adopted short term rentals, we had that primary residence requirement from the get go, it remains a strong value. Um, but after three years or so of, of licensing, we saw some improvements that could be made right um, to that particular requirement. And we did that earlier this year, um, this committee had a, a, a big hand in shaping the way that looked. Um, similarly, you know, whenever we're always going to be identifying new issues new problems, new trends. Uh, we try to be very data oriented as much as we can here. And you know, if, if, if the ordinance passes and we see areas um, for additional improvement after a time of implementation, um, you know, then we will remain open to making sure that it functions in the best way possible to serve the values and the goals of Denver um, while also you know, taking advantage of the opportunities that the short-term rental industry provides for all of our residents here. So um, just wanted to mention that as well and um, thank I Aisha for her you know, spirit of collaboration. I know we've seen a lot of different representatives from Airbnb on this committee um, and it has been nice to you know, see the same face um, uh, multiple meetings in a row. So I think that is uh, much appreciated. Erica? If yes. I might, you may I'm going to mirror what everyone says about, and I want to thank you, excise and licensing, for being ahead of the pack of cities in this country grappling with, with uh, this short term rental. Uh, Aisha, again, thanks for being in on the process for a few months uh, going forward, but as always, the middle ground that you spoke about was, is, and always will be the protection of the citizens and neighborhoods of Denver. That is that's why we have this committee. So uh, going forward, that will always be the number one objective. Um, and one more thing, still haven't really grappled with the number of days that a host um, or primary resident may be away from the uh, facility that they're hosting. So that'll be on our agenda going forward. Thank you. If I may jump in after George here, since George likes to jump in after me, <laughs> I just wanted to say, Thank you to everybody that put in the time and the effort to make this additional meeting that wasn't on the calendar. I um, have been communicating more with different cities to learn how they're operating and navigating this new world, whether it's the COVID world or the sharing economy world. And I don't think that there are many destinations that have a standing committee like STRAC. And I think it's acknowledging the reality that this is something that while vacation rentals have been around for years and timeshares, but short-term rentals and the capacity in which they exist is still new. And the way that we operate and the standards that we create and the way that we regulate is an evolving process. And I think that's just a testimony to the vibrant city that we live in um, for us to be open-minded and always having it be like an open door policy and the way that we discuss the topics of short-term rentals. So I'm so excited to be on the STRAC committee as of March. And I just want to thank Excise and License for the efforts that they put forward in bringing the second meeting on the agenda and spelling everything out so beautifully where it can sometimes feel a little bit complicated to comprehend. So thank you. You're quite welcome. Um, okay, I think that is everybody. I don't see anyone else on the committee with their hand raised. 
do have my hand raised this time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I just want to say, Dana, thanks for bringing that up. I think we are a leader with having the task force. And I think that makes for much better rulings and uh, charter laws. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, if everything goes according to the timeline, when should the platforms expect um, them to become compliant? And then my second question is, what is the remedy if fines, the fines are not paid and how long will they be given to uh, pay a fine if one does happen? So um, that's a great question, Cindy, about the effective date. And it is something that we also um, recently realized that um, you know, was not addressed in the ordinance. Now, typically, if it's not addressed, it would go into effect upon signature. Um, but hearing some feedback from platforms about technology, um, we have decided to update the draft as well to be effective February 1st, um, to have an effective date of February 1st. So, you know, that gives some platforms. We've heard um, from one booking service provider say that they have a website freeze at the end of the year where they can't make any changes. So they would need to do some work ahead of time um, and some testing. So um, in order to give, um, and then other uh, platforms have talked about wanting to do educational campaigns with their members. So um, in order to provide some time for that, um, we decided to put an effective date of February 1st, just to give some extra time before um, you know that, that strict liability for processing transactions would become effective. So. Um, that's a great question and one that, uh, you know, just goes to show that the process of getting feedback um, always provides, um, you know, the opportunity to make something better, so. Um, I also had a question somewhat related to that, which is uh, going back a ways. If a platform after February 1st, when this goes into effect, um, if a platform like accidentally allows a guest to book and the city goes, hey, you just allowed a guest to book on a, a listing that is not licensed. Um, let's say the guest books a month out and the city knows that this happened a, a day out. I don't know what your notification process will be, but assuming it's something like that, will uh, platforms have the ability to fix that before they're fined $1,000 by let's say canceling that reservation before it would happen and refunding the guests their money? I would say that's probably a, a more legal question than I should probably answer because it will just depend on the facts and circumstances. I know that that's an annoying answer that lawyers give um, that is not super helpful when you're curious about a particular hypothetical, but um, I just put this chart back up that, you know, if it gets processed, it's subject to fine. Um, you know, if there are, you know, circumstances and facts that, um, you know, well, I'll just leave it there. It depends on the circumstances and facts. Yeah, I think that's that would also be my answer to um, David. So I also want to go back to the question that we had before. I know that that was a, a two part question. Um, the second question was, um, how how long does a platform have to pay fines if they're if they're liable? Um, and, and I think the question after that is something that we are going to have to figure out. What happens when a platform just doesn't want to pay? They say, you know, I'm not licensed in Denver. I'm, I I don't have. I'm not incorporated in Denver. I'm not I'm not going to pay the fine. Um, we do have another tool at our in our belt. Um, if if a um, platform continuous continuously um, books unlicensed um, hosts um, and then chooses not to pay fines, we could go after them with the preliminary injunction, which would bar them from operating in Denver. Um, I mean, I think we have to take baby steps with this one at this point, though. Um, that's something that we have in our toolkit, but, you know, we have to, we would have to see how it goes before we, we go that route. That would be a much bigger um a bigger step that we would take. Do you have a good process for discovering illegal transactions? 
Um, and I, I would, I'd have to defer to Brian or Erica on that one um, when it comes to when the comes to enforcement. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? I'm wondering how you'll know that this is happening unless you just, uh, a neighbor reports it or something. How, how, how will the city know that a, a place is being rented that doesn't have a license? Um, so that's a great question. Um, we have a couple different, um, you know, enforcement tools, investigation um, paths, you know, as similar to, you know, other vice uh, stings that, you know, I, I keep using the example of bars because it's such an easy one for people to understand and relate to, um, you know, so we could use that method. Um, but I mean, to be frank, you know, we're not going to catch every single one, um, but we want platforms to know that if they process one, they are subject to that enforcement effort. So when we, um, as I mentioned at the last track, we are currently in the process of, um, we ended our contract with host compliance and we are in the process of signing a new contract for compliance software. So um, that's something that we've talked with all of the vendors about and you know what kind of tools and capabilities that they have to help us um, with this enforcement goal. Um, and so I, I can't really speak about specifics just because that's covered by that um, confidential process, but that is something we've discussed with them. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so at this time, it's about, we have about 15 minutes left, so I want to go into public comment. I haven't received any emails signing up um, so I'm going to go to the attendees list, and I know that Councilwoman Sidabaka had her hand raised, so I am going to promote her to a panelist. Uh, Councilwoman, thanks for joining us. Do you have any um, comments or questions that you'd like to share with the committee? Actually, my questions were answered, so appreciate it and um, put my hand down. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I saw the hand went down, but I just wanted to double check. Thank you. Okay, um, do any, if any of the other attendees, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm going to interpret that as um, no other public comments, um, which is a rarity, but I will um, take that as a sign that everyone understands where we are and doesn't have questions, so that's good. And that would be the end of our slideshow. So we have actually finished 15 minutes early. Um, I will give you 15 minutes back of your day. Um, thanks to everyone who was able to join us. Thank you for all of your thoughtful questions. Um, we really appreciate you all being here and being really engaged and providing us with really thoughtful, detailed feedback. It always helps us make better decisions, so. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, talk soon. Happy weekend. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Erica.